2023. As hashtag cringe as it is to admit, video games played a tangible part this year in shaping me just a little bit more into my final evolution when I turn 25 in 3 years and my frontal lobe finishes developing. Over the last couple years I've slowly become more and more of an optimist. For video games, I've become less jaded and the stuff I played had a part in that. I spent a lot of time this year partaking in a lot of stuff that leans heavily into the games are art, look at how artful and meaningful we are camp. But, I also kept my feet firmly planted in the art, the fuck does that mean, shoot this and jump on that region that I find myself most comfortable with. So. I'm going to talk about the junk, the trash, and the rubbish, and the nasty shit I rolled around in all year long, because when else am I going to talk about corn kids? Meticulous! If there's one word to describe almost everything I played this year, it's meticulous, and no other game is represented better by this than Pikmin 4. I've rambled about my admiration for this series before, and while my views have slightly changed, here's a legal declaration for my current views on Pikmin 2, I still think the series is one of, if not the finest, and Pikmin 4 is, well, another one of those. I wouldn't say this is a good introduction to the series, with how much of the general flow of the game was changed, this really doesn't represent the other ones. Pikmin 4 is a whole of the beast. Pikmin 1 to 3, in my opinion, are resource management games. They're all about surviving and maybe thriving if you're good enough. Pikmin 4 is about being a god amongst all you survey. If you've never played a Pikmin game before, you're probably looking at this footage and thinking, this just looks like Pikmin 3 but with a better camera. And I wish, I really wish I could explain how this game with the funny critters plays fundamentally different to this one, but I don't have the brains for that. It's mostly the dog. Oatbrain, the wonder pup, streamlines the game so much it's amazing. In the originals, but mostly too, you were using Pikmin as a form of defense. You could play on the attack, but most of the time Pikmin were a means of keeping yourself alive. In 4, you can now go sprinting into oncoming doom, assaulting anything in your path without mercy. And the design of the world has changed to accommodate this. The game feels so big and expansive, with the areas going from puzzles to be solved into realms for you to conquer. It feels insanely good to decimate someone in a Dandori battle or clean out a cave from top to bottom. All this treasure is here because you showed up and wrecked shit, not because you were starving to death and had no other option. Pikmin 3 is still my favourite of the series, but Pikmin 4 is definitely biting at his ankles. Continuing the theme of meticulous, but going from throwing little critters to playing games developed by them, I played a little platformer this year called Celeste. A game I grabbed on sale, and you ever get that feeling when everybody rants and raves about a piece of media but you never got around to it because life gets in the way and really all that praise kind of taints the thing in your mind? But then when you finally sit down and say fuck it, let's give it a go, it's one of the best things you've ever experienced just like everybody said it would be but instead of basking in the light of finding something you really like you get mad at yourself for taking so long to get to it yeah that happened to me if you want to know the intricacies trust me there's about 2.4 billion videos full of people explaining down to the pixel what makes this game incredible and considering how often it goes on sale for less than a cup of coffee don't make the same mistake i did celeste has got charm up the wazoo and somehow manages to perfectly walk the tightrope of giving you the fuzziest feeling deep down in your heart and then immediately slapping you in the face with platforming so tightly composed it makes you want to explode. It's just plain as strawberry! The characters and their stories, while pretty simple when boiled down, come off as extremely authentic. The quiet contemplation through the conversations and the sparse piano pieces during the downtime really resonated with me. And while, yes, I am mad at myself for taking so long to get to this game, it's really quite a good thing that I did. If I had played this thing back when it came out, I would have blasted through it, ignoring the story, painting its artsy fartsy wanky garbage, and it would have sat in my library collecting e dust. <laughs> I treated a lot of good stories storytelling in games like this when I was younger. I saw that one John Carmack quote and said, yeah, that's my personality, leading me to do things like removing Undertale from my Steam account as a joke, and now it won't let me re-add it, so I can never own Undertale ever again. I said I can never own- I'm glad that in my journey to grow my heart like a certain green fuzzy bastard, I can appreciate a small, lovely little pixelated tale of overcoming personal odds. And there is absolutely no other reason it connected with me whatsoever. Cats are pretty cool. <laughs> On Christmas Day 2022, my good pal Ian bought me a copy of Stray. And you can watch my first hour or so of the game unfold in this unfinished Let's Play I recorded with him and Jeff, the King of Lard. But due to the three of us unfortunately having these, I didn't get another chance to play the game until eight months later when I decided, fuck it, if we can't record it, I'll just enjoy the game alone. Once again, I am a... 
fucking idiot for not doing so sooner. Stray's world is teeming with offbeat personality, and I love the art style. Sure, the way you experience the lore and the story is nothing groundbreaking, this game has Sony exclusive written all over it, but what it does manage to do is streamline the process of these types of games. Much like a cat, I don't have time for this shit. The production value is all there, but the game also knows at the end of the day, you're playing as a cat, and it never stops you from indulging in the delights of being a stupid moron idiot. Pokemon Scarlet was an ambitious but doomed from the start mess that, while trying desperately to evolve the formula and scope of the series ends up going backwards and making the player uncomfortable with its stuttering, glitchy, ugly monotony. Good thing I played Gen 5 this year. Pokemon White 2, the game that capped off the generation of Pokemon that many people consider to be the last really good one, and the best of the good ones at that. I used to be one of those people that took one look at a set of keys and cast aside this Gen's Pokemon as dumb, but in my newfound consumer wisdom, Trubbish and Vanilla Ice- Vanilla Ice? <laughs> not like Trubbish and Vanilla Ice are beloved in my sweaty, gross heart. I did a new playthrough of The Outer Worlds this year after not touching it since my initial playthrough when it came out, and I still attest that if you put the comparisons of New Vegas out of your mind, which is much easier said than done, I know. You get a short but sweet little game with more interesting shit to do and more to say than most games that cost double its price. Super Mario Wonder. I did a fat ramble about this game when I was still actively playing it, and yeah, it's still great. This thing is video game comfort food, the type of experience which perfectly lends itself to escapism. Mario games are just always filled with a certain kind of whimsy that you used to get from watching Disney movies before they became bland corporate sludge. Well, except for the Mario games which are bland corporate sludge. Yeah, it's not gonna win any awards for challenging players or pushing the envelope or anything. But if you want a game that will kick the shit out of you, Celeste and all its little strawberries are right there waiting for you. And when you finish with that and life starts giving you shit, Mario will be there to give you a pat on the back like a comforting, greasy stepdad. <laughs> this is the kind of game that in a few years people are going to be posting about it constantly under the context of nostalgic yearning. It's good. Turning the dimension from the second to the third, and taking the studio from the big to the microscopic, I played a little game called Corn Kids 64. Corn Kids is an N64 style 3D platformer channeling Banjo Kazooie and Mario 64, but with a very mid 2000s artistic flair. If you know me, you know I love anything that reeks of a 2006 personal web page, and this game has that in abundance. One of my favourite things any piece of media can do, whether it's a film, TV show, game, book, or zine floating in a puddle in an alleyway, is express the vision of a sole artist or a small team of them. It's like if you took the zaniness and humour from Earthworm Jim 3D and Space Station Silicon Valley along with the jokes from an Invader Zim Tumblr fan blog and made it all comfortable to play. Also it works on the Steam Deck, so if you needed another reason to buy that, there you go. Like me. For today's snack time, we're going to be looking at the Ferrero Rocher. This is a 2024 model, and as you can tell, the previous owner took very due diligence in looking after this, as there's very little wear or tear on the unit. Let's go ahead and get it open and give it a try. I apologize for the state of my nails. They were done by a chimp on Adderall. Now that the snack is opened, we can take a glance at its true inside glory, and of course, have a taste. Yeah, it's pretty good. When talking about games I played in 2023 that represent the artistic version of one specific person without compromise no matter how much it may aid or harm the final product, there's one game that comes to mind. Death Stranding. Oh boy. This game has been my first experience with the Hideo Kojima project. I've never touched anything else he's done before this and... Holy shit, what an impression. This game is a total and utter contradiction to itself, and so is my relationship with it. See, here's a list of things I typically dislike in a video game. Hand holding and constantly taking away control from the player. Having a story which frequently requires the player to not engage with the game. Mechanics that seemingly have nothing to do with each other and get little explanation. Being exceedingly long for no real reason when by the halfway point you've done everything the game has to offer, so you're just kind of recycling Having a story with the interesting end. amounts of mystery, but then painfully explaining in heavy amounts of detail every single one. Of those Weird mysteries. one off quest where you reconnect the girl with her pseudo father figure with god awful voice acting and they get married in a weird, not really incest, but incest vibed affair, and the whole thing is incredibly uncomfortable. Death Stranding is one of the most frustrating yet amazing things I've ever experienced. Not since Tommy Wiseau's The Room have I ever seen something so unflinchingly committed to the vision of one man get a budget so huge that no matter how ridiculous the vision gets, it's all there and accounted for. It almost feels like some ridiculous creepypasta game with how much it loves to break the fourth wall and just 
just how unconventional it is. This game is the epitome of not just having your cake and eating it too, but trying to eat the entire fucking bakery out of business. It is, at any given time, a relaxing atmospheric walking simulator, a heart-pounding stealth horror game, an animated feature film, a weird offbeat comedy, a high-octane shooting gallery, a cat and mouse chase, a resource management survival game, and a really bad swimming simulator. And all of this, this high-budget, high-scope, grandiose, world-bending shit, is in service of a game about delivering packages from one place to another. And while this should all make the player infuriated, for me, it just added to how unique it all is. Death Stranding is the kind of game where you really just need to put your preconceptions on what is and what should be aside and enjoy the ride for what it is, twists and all. In the weeks coming up to Christmas, I legitimately got addicted to this game. The loop of taking on packages and managing your resources while you plot a route through the unfriendly, if gorgeous landscape was unlike anything I'd played before. Yes, I've played Breath of the Wild, they're not the same. It was the perfect game to finish off the year with. A piece of art that's so earnestly itself, so uncaring about whether or not you you like it, that it shines through because of it. Also, Norman Reedus drinking monsters. So, that's every major game I played throughout 2023. A lot of goofy, artsy, fartsy, wanky stuff. But how do they rank up? Who is the wankiest art house slot? Who fest? is? Ranking. Number eight, The Outer World. It gets too much shit and calling it soulless or empty is a huge over-exaggeration. I will admit the game is too tiny for its own good and the fact it took me four years to even think about playing again kinda shows that. It's a good game, seven, Pokemon Y2. It's probably the best Pokemon game. It's definitely the peak in terms of the battle system and the overall design and in just a gameplay sense, it's the most flawless execution of a Pokemon game. Bring back 2D Pokemon with animated sprites, you fuck. Six Coin Kids 64. The fact that the world is still being treated to zany 3D collectathons like it's 2000 2 is a miracle, and Corn Kids is the best throwback 3D platformer I've played in a very long time. Fuck a hat in time, fuck Yuka, the one horn goat has come to claim his crown. Five. Stray. Call me an epic redditor of doom all you want, but I won't deny my feelings. I love the stupid cat game with the pretty graphics and the synthy soundtrack. I love the goofy robot guys and the stupid jokes they put in it. Number four, Dolman Reader's Dragon. The fact is this high up the list is a contradiction, and I should have every reason in the world to hate this game, but the fact I resonated with it that much more anyways is probably the most death stranding thing it could do. So three, Mario Wonder. It, it's Mario. Two, Celeste. I can already tell from my one playthrough that this is gonna be one of those games that becomes part of my yearly ritual to consume gang, along with Portal 2 and Aqua Teen Hunger Force. One. A bag, man. It's everything I could have wanted from a new Pikmin game. A game that manages to evolve what works and shake up the foundations at the same time. And one of the few times I can say the amount of time it took to make it was fully worth it. It has Ochi. 